Hi, welcome, welcome. I'm Victoria Alexander, and I'm the owner of a boutique real estate firm called Realty Collective that as of June 1st, so two weeks ago, um, turned 17. I did nothing to celebrate, but it is a milestone that I'm I'm proud of because I've been working in real estate for probably about 20 years here in New York City. And I started this company to defy the stereotypes associated with, in particular, New York City real estate agents. I'm sure you all have um, some experience uh, that sort of builds up that stereotype that is not so so pretty. Um, or you've seen this, the Seinfeld episode. <laughs> um, I am a matchmaker, a therapist, a coach, and I will go to bat for you, advocate for you, and help you reach your goals. If your goal is to reach to buy a home, we're going to go that path. If your goal is to stay in your rent stabilized apartment for the rest of your life, I'm going to help you figure that out too. So, um, my guy, my my job is really to help you figure out your real estate goals and for you to reach them. I'm going to introduce the dream team. This is the most important people that you need for this process to represent you, to make sure you're covered so you're educated and can make the right decisions for yourself, which is a lawyer, a mortgage professional, and a real estate broker. So I've been working with these women um, for countless deals now. It is a great team to have and to work with. You need accountability. Um, I have a deal right now where the other brokers like just keep saying, I'm so sorry, Victoria, I didn't recommend this mortgage broker. I did not recommend this lawyer. I have no relationship with them. And I feel for her. It's also, in, you know, has implications on our deal and how the process is going. So really making sure that you pick a team of people that have accountability to each other and then work together well and aren't going to kill your deal. You know, if you bring in somebody from outside, sometimes they can not always advocate, for, they think they're advocating for you, but because this is not what they do normally can actually cost you the apartment, time, money, lots of other things. So I'm going to introduce these other strong women right now. Uh, Lisa, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks. Hi everybody, my name is Lisa. I am a loan officer at Cross Country Mortgage. Um, I've been, doing this for almost 10 years. Um, I specialize with first time home buyers. Um, I love helping people buy their first home. It's super exciting. Um, I work all over the country, but my specialty really like about 95% of my business is New York City condos, co-ops, multifamilies. So really excited to talk to you a little bit more about the crazy thing of buying a house in New York and answering your guys' questions. Okay, and handing it over to Rashida. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rashida Sadiq. I'm a partner in the firm Soprico, Soprico and Sadiq. I have been practicing for 19 years now. Um, Primarily, I represent clients that are purchasing or selling um, properties. I do represent a lot of first-time buyers, so I look forward to giving you some insight on things that your attorney should be doing on your behalf to make sure that you are, um, you know, you're properly represented. I'm licensed in both New York and New Jersey. I represent most of my clients in the boroughs and also uh, Westchester and Long Island as well, in both co-ops, condos, and um, house purchases and sales. Thank you so much, Rashida. So um, just going back to the roles here. So my role really is to be your, your coach, your advocate, your sounding board, your emotional support person, um, because that is usually what first-time home buyers need to get through this process. Literally, my job is to guide you through and give you the best advice that I've been exposed to for the last 17 years, all the ups and downs and other people's mistakes um, that you want to avoid. And at this point, I've experienced most of the crazy scenarios you've probably heard of. And what do I cost? Um, there's no cost to you to have a buyer's broker. When you walk into a home that is on Street Easy and there's a broker there, that person represents the seller their fiduciary responsibility is to the seller and they're going to advocate for the seller, even though they're so nice and they made you cookies and gave you free water and maybe even sandwiches, whatever they're giving out at the open houses these days that you've been to, um, that person is trying to um, 
get the seller the best deal for them. And they're advocating for the seller, not for the buyer. So you need your own representation. It comes as no cost to you to have a buyer's broker. And that could be me or another broker, but it's someone that you vetted, that you have interviewed, and that you feel comfortable talking to because they are going to help you um, through this transaction process and into becoming a homeowner. I'm gonna protect you from your own instincts and help you get to the closing table. And I don't need to say again one more time that it doesn't cost you anything. The seller pays all the brokers. Um, it's wrapped into their closing costs. So these are the three people you need, a buyer's agent, the attorney, the mortgage professional. Uh, I already said that part. You're gonna interview everybody and make sure you feel comfortable with them and that you can, they can answer your questions in a way that you understand the way they speak to you and that you feel comfortable actually taking advice from them. And making sure that your personality types go well together and they don't clash. And pick advisors that have relationships in the industry. The one thing that I love about working with this team is that when I talk to another broker and they're like, oh, who's their lawyer? And I was like, oh, Rashida. And they're like, oh, we know that. Oh, who, what mortgage company are they working? Oh, Cross Country and Lisa. Oh, we know them. Okay, great. Like they want the confidence to know that they have professionals that have industry history and expertise to close the deal. And so make sure that you pick people that have that. It is always in your best interest if you pick somebody that has a reputation, um, a positive reputation because and been working for a really long time. Everyone's like, oh, well, I wanna work with my friend. They just got their license a year ago. They usually don't have relationships. When I call Susie Doe and say, hey, I have a buyer and they're gonna put in an offer. And Susie's like, oh, Victoria, we did this in this track. I know exactly what to expect from working with you. I like working with you. I know how you're gonna make sure your buyer stays on the right path and gets to the closing table. They want reliable, counterparts and partnerships with the other brokers. We work together, the buyer's broker and the seller's broker to make the deal happen. And they want to pick people that they know and trust that can keep a transaction on track. So, oh, the last thing is advice is, do not hire your uncle. Your uncle's a lawyer. Unless your uncle, and even in this case, I advise against it, is practicing New York City real estate law doing co-ops and condos and one to four family houses in New York City and Brooklyn and understands that that is their specific expertise. Do not hire our family members. The amount of money you save is not worth the aggravation in the long run that it will probably cost you. Um, let refer a bunch of people to them for their expertise, but please pick somebody that comes recommended to you by either your professionals that you've already chosen or somebody else that has had an experience with them. Okay, enough about the uncle. Why buy? We all remember, and it's still still true, and now, as we know from the last couple of weeks and the articles that have come up, the rent is too damn high, and you have no control over it. Um, rents have never been closer, and you are even over, in some cases, in some neighborhoods, what it costs to pay your monthly mortgage. So if you are in a position to be buying why are you paying somebody else's mortgage? Because as a renter in New York City, that is exactly what you're doing. You're paying your landlord's mortgage, the, the giant management company's mortgage, the underlying mortgage for the property. So you should be investing in yourself instead of helping other people invest in them. Um, buying is a great option to pick your own design. You're investing, making a long-term appreciation investment in yourself. Like there's usually a five to 10% return every year on real estate in New York City. So my house is worth $100,000 now. Next year, it's worth $105,000 and it keeps getting compounded. I've owned my house for 12 years. Um, and you know that's equity. That's like you're saving. You're putting money away every month by investing in your, in your property. Next slide. So there is a little thing called the rent to buy matrix that the New York Times has developed where you can plug in some specific things like if you're not going to stay in New York City for the next five years, then buying might not be a good option for you if you plan on moving out, um, especially if you want to buy a co-op. You get to plug the numbers into this platform on the New York Times and uh, see if what it's really costing you, um, renting versus buying, and um, what that you know what the variables mean 
maybe you're in a rent stabilized apartment and it's too good of a deal and you should not, it's going to tell you never leave. Um, but that is something that we use to help people calculate and see the numbers of what renting really costs them. Um, Sarah, you're giving the, the link there in the chat to figure out that algorithm. Um, so the first thing you're going to do is assemble your team. So you've had the, the three main people you need, your attorney, your mortgage professional, your real estate broker. Um, you may need an inspector. We're going to advise always to have every property inspected. You might need a contractor because maybe you need to upgrade a couple of things like the kitchen or the bath or the floors need to be redone. And you might need an architect because maybe you want to reconfigure buying a one to four family house and you're going to reconfigure it and turn it into one family house. Those are people that we can recommend and that you should have have start having conversations with them if those are the sort of properties you're interested in moving forward with. And you, the first person you call in this process is your mortgage professional. And you do not look on Street Easy. You do not go to open houses. Um, you call a mortgage professional, understand your buying power. If a bank will even give you a loan because maybe your credit's 400 because you didn't pay that medical bill that, and when you moved and they don't have your forwarding address and they've been chasing you and you never paid it, you need to fix that. And so you're not gonna be able to get the loan. Or you're self-employed and you didn't talk to a mortgage professional and you filed your taxes and you have to wait a whole nine months because you didn't file them in a way that looks the best way to banks. And that's a conversation that, we should, uh, that Lisa will have to, with you. So this is an important first step that you know the properties are going to be available to you, that if for some reason, and I'm gonna say this happens pretty regularly, the first day you go out, you find a property you're in love with, you are ready to make an offer and be competitive on that property. You cannot do that unless you have a pre-approval letter. Lisa, tell us about what that looks like. Yeah, sure. So, um, so like Victoria said, it's really important to talk to a mortgage professional first to figure out what your buying power is. That's because you don't wanna waste time looking at things that are above what you can get qualified for for a mortgage because that's no fun. You also don't wanna undersell yourself of what you think you might be able to be pre-approved for. Um, so the first thing you do, you know, if you reach out to me will be to have a conversation. And actually a mortgage is actually a much more personal process than I think a lot of people think. Um, I'm gonna talk to you and get some basic information from you. I'm gonna find out what your job history is like. Are you self-employed? What are you looking to buy? How much do you have for a down payment? Um, and then we're gonna have a conversation about what you think you might wanna buy. Um, I'm then going to get some information from you. I'm going to run your credit and then I'm going to get you a pre-approval. And that pre-approval is, is really a working draft. So as you start to see things with Victoria and you really fine tune what you're actually looking at um, purchasing, we will tweak that pre-approval to, um, to reflect, you know, what you want to buy. Um, why I say the mortgage process is pretty personal is, you know, so I'm a correspondent lender. That means that I am a mortgage bank, just like the big banks, but all I do is mortgages. Um, what makes me stand out a little bit is that we have a whole bunch of different products. So I can talk to you and figure out what's going to be the right fit for you. It may be your traditional 20% down, 30-year fixed. It may not. And we'll have a conversation as to what that means. Um, in terms of down payment, you can put down as little as three and a half percent if you go FHA to the more traditional 20% down to more than 20% down. If you buy an investment property, that means a property you're not going to live in, typically you need to put 25% down. Um, we have um, income limitation programs where basically these are special programs offered by New York State based on your income and the purchase price. Um, and we also have um, sort of non-traditional programs. So programs where we use different ways to qualify you than your traditional income. Um, if you are self-employed, um, it's really, really important that we talk 
before you start looking at stuff because I definitely need to look at your tax returns. The general role with getting qualified is whatever you pay taxes on is what is used to qualify you. Um, so I have a lot of borrowers that I talk to, you know, now. So what we need to do to get your tax returns for 2022 ready so that you can buy something in 2023. Um, which the third thing I just want to say is, is that this is an ongoing process. So you might be on this call right now and you're like, dude, I'm not going to be able to buy something for two years. We should still talk because I, I mean, I have bars. I have a bar that I closed two months ago on a co-op that it was a three-year conversation when we really got them to a place that they were ready to buy. Um, and um, you can put like, for example, 10% down and not do FHA. You have what's called private mortgage insurance. So there's a whole bunch of different options based on what what you want. Um, a few things you need to know, if you're looking at a co-op, traditionally you need to put 20% down. And if you are looking at a co-op, they usually have more stricter ideas in terms of qualification than a bank. So we'll have a conversation of what that means to make sure you are in a place that works both for getting approved for a mortgage and also getting approved with, by the co-op board. Um, I do all types of loans, investment, commercial, residential, condo, co-op, multifamily. So there typically isn't a scenario that I don't have an option for. Um, and there's one other thing I was going to tell you. Oh, so the really important thing after you get pre-approved is I am pre-approving you based on the financial picture and snapshot that you're getting, giving me. So after you get pre-approved, you should not look for a new job without talking to me. You should not buy a new car without talking to me. Um, all of those things change your qualification status. That doesn't mean you can't get a new job or get a new car or get a new credit card. That means that we should talk first before you do that so that we make sure everything still works based on the pre-approval I gave you. Um, and after you have that pre-approval, you will go out with, with Victoria and start looking at places and we will tweak it as needed. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is rate concern right now. So rate is a little bit of a dance. Um, once you lock in a rate, you have to close um, before that rate lock expires or you have to pay extension fees and they can get really expensive really fast. So when you're getting pre-approved, we're being a little conservative on the rate because we want to make sure that in this volatile market, you are still good for that purchase price if rates go up. Um, rates have been going up, then they sort of went down, then Friday they went up again. So it, it is a little bit of a dance. Um, I do have to say what I'm advising all of my borrowers right now is that, um, you know, we're in an inflation period. Uh, the writing's on the wall. A recession is going to happen in a year or two. We very well might refinance you when rates go down. Um, just because you have the rate you have when you purchase this home, by no means means that's the rate you're going to have for a 30-year on your mortgage. So what I'm telling all my borrowers is I'm going to get you the best rate possible. I'm going to get you closed. And then once rates start to go down, which they will, we might have a conversation about refinancing you. And that's a conversation I would have with you guys as well. Thanks, Lisa. Lisa, that was a lot of information. Um, I also want to say that working with a company that is familiar with the New York City market, specifically co-ops, every time somebody comes with me comes to me with a pre-approval from Quicken or Rocket Mortgage or Better, the other broker on the other end of the deal is asking me for a pre-approval from another bank because of the issues with these online platforms that they are just not as well vetted or strong and as strong as, you know, working with a, a bank or mortgage professional. So please do not um, think that because Better.com told you you could afford a million dollars that you're gonna be able to afford a million dollars um, without getting vetted by 
an actual company and person that works in New York City real estate market. It's just a misconception that those companies um, are competitive here in New York and that brokers will accept uh, a pre-approval from them. And or and a I lawyer. Just add with that, that's totally true, Victoria. And I would just also add that, you know, like a rocket, I mean, I know that my customer service and my rates are just as competitive as are better than a rocket or a better. But, you know, if you're look, I, I, this is like what I tell my clients, if you're looking for like a home in Colorado, you know, rocket or a single family home in Colorado, rocket or better might be a good fit for you because that's really their mo the model they're using. New York City and even New York State is totally different than the rest of the country, like completely. And um, you really, really, really want to use a New York experienced mortgage professional because frankly, without that experience, you're going to have issues closing. Um, and that's going to be a real headache. So, um, so yeah, definitely a hundred percent, make sure the person that you are vetting and interviewing understands condos, understands co-ops, look them up online, make sure that they have a real New York city presence, because that's really, really important, especially in this market to make sure that you get to the closing table and you get closed. A hundred percent. So I'm glad that we discussed that. Um, so now that you have your pre-approval, there's um, a time when we start thinking about some questions, of reflection questions to help you reach your goals and for you to understand your goals. Like homeownership is a goal, but is it a goal in the next one to three months or in five years? And if it's in five years, you know, let's make a plan and work with a financial advisor to get you to reach that goal, um, to do the savings, to fix your credit report, to get, you know, your income up to the number you want it to be. Uh, you can make a plan to reach that and we can do that together. So it's never too early to start the conversation with the three of us to plan out that we're going to be helping you find a home in one to three months or in five years. Then you want to think about the rest of your strategy and see, these are some of the questions I have people think about um, to reflect on, which is um, how long do you want to live here? Usually the plan should be at least five years. Are you gonna be starting a family? And do you need to think about school district? Does your commute matter to you? And is it gonna change? And does that change gonna impact your, the desirability of the neighborhood you were considering? Do you wanna be by certain amenities like a park, the waterfront, certain subway stops, you know, or like you wanna be in downtown Brooklyn in the middle of shopping district? Like what are the things that are important to you long-term? Um, and budget, how much do you wanna spend on the property, how much do you wanna spend monthly? What are your monthly expenses gonna be that you're gonna feel comfortable with? So those are the sort of considerations we take in before we start looking on Street Easy and seeing different apartments in different neighborhoods and not understanding what's included in the mortgage or, the, and, or I'm sorry, in the maintenance or the common charges and that there's a difference. Taxes are included in co-op um, uh, fees. So that's something to take into consideration. But understanding these things is important before you jump in, um, because once you jump in, Street Easy, Zillow, Realtor.com is going to start sending tons of emails with properties, and you're going to start feeling overwhelmed, and maybe you're going to lose sight of what is best for you, and we should reflect on that before we start this journey. So I have a quick overview of the types of housing you might see in New York City. Um, and the things that you should consider for them, which is location, the site, the type of property and the amenities. It's a big difference between co-ops and condos, um, or one to fa four family houses. Co-ops, there's you have to get past the board that the prices are cheaper, common charges are higher, um, closing costs are lower, but they have a lot more say in the way that they steer the building and the type of tenants that they want to have in the building, you also can't, there's a lot of restrictions on renting out the apartment. So if you're not staying there for five years and something comes up like a new job opportunity, you'll be tied into that property and possibly only be able to rent it for one or two years, some not at all, or some have you know, some pretty loose rental rules, but understanding that that's what we have to consider when considering co-op properties. And then, you know, if you really wanted to be in a doorman building, which is mostly co-ops, there are only certain neighborhoods that have that um, type of property. 
Brooklyn Heights, Prospect Heights, anything that is a more older historic neighborhood, not full of new construction is gonna have your co-ops with doorman built, which are doorman buildings that come with, you know, sometimes they come with porters and live in supers and different amenities where new construction comes with pool sometimes on the roof and gyms in the building, um, you know, elevator buildings, a lot of Williamsburg, Bushwick, downtown Brooklyn, Gowanus, uh, bed -Stuy. These are the sort of neighborhoods that have new construction. And there's a whole different um, set of information that I'm gonna share with you not after this about new construction that you need to consider um, that we can maybe read, Sheeta will touch on later. Uh, so that's, you know, think, considering the building typology and the neighborhoods then that will house that, that typology. I always tell people to make their list of five deal breakers. And guess what? You're only gonna get two or three of them because this is New York City and you're limited with uh, your options. Co-ops, the closing costs, like I said, are a little bit less, so one to 3%, um, three to 5% for condos and new construction is only condos. And those come with brand new building fees fees like transfer taxes. Um, sellers also have closing costs and they're usually around 8%. So you need to make up 11% of a return on your property to cover your closing costs and um, the closing costs that you're gonna have to incur when you sell. So you wanna make sure that you're taking those into consideration when you are selling. Uh, we call it the break even horizon to make sure you meet the covering those other expenses besides the purchase price. And where do you find these homes? Are you looking on StreetEasy, Zillow, Realtor.com? You can put in the chat what your favorite search platform is. Sometimes people are some people are using Google Search, making Excel sheets. Um, if I haven't said one that you're using, I'm always interested in learning about new platforms. And people used to think that real estate agent's job was to help you find the property. The needle in the haystack does not like listed on the internet anywhere, you know, or, you know, listed anywhere that you could find normally, but the internet changed all that. So most real estate brokers are Rebney members and the real estate board of New York, Rebney has made it so that the industry is transparent. So if I get a listing, unless the seller signs a specific document saying to leave it off the Rebney site for a specific reason in their exclusive, you have to put the property on the Real Estate Board of New York's distribution site within 24 hours of getting the listing. And so that means that we all have access to the same information. The only in certain cases where, you know, Susie Doe calls me and says, Victoria, I know you have, we just did this other deal and in this, is your buyer still interested? Or do you have, I know you work with a lot of buyers like this, I'm gonna have this listing come up and I haven't put it on the market yet. That's when, once in a while that will happen, but usually they're still, since they have a fiduciary responsibility to the sellers are still gonna list it, but they wanna get you ready so that you can jump on this and they can close the deal pretty quickly. Because time on market is what kills deals for sellers. So I talked a little about the market with real estate. And so what the job really of real estate agents is, is to help you win the offer and win the place that you um, fall in love with because it's a competitive market and there's only so many leverage points you have and you wanna know how to take advantage of them. So the job of the real estate broker in this case is to be your coach, to coach you to getting to the closing table, which means advising you on how to present yourself in the best light to win the bid and win the apartment that, um, the bidding war and get the apartment that you um, have your heart set on. And I have to say, there's only like two people that didn't fall through on that last year for me. Um, one was because of financial limitations that they lost the bid just because they couldn't ever get pushed to the number that the department closed at because we all know how crazy it is or it has been. And the other person just said, you know what, this is too much for me. I'm not gonna buy right now. So I think it's really important and is a testament to the buyers that we've worked with that almost all of them are getting the apartments that they put offers in um, the first apartment that they fell in love with after looking and seeing things for a majority of them for a long time. Um, if you are using a public platform, I do recommend StreetEasy. Rebney has working on developing their own platform, but it doesn't aggregate all the information 
to the public yet. It's only in-house for brokers. Um, when you're looking at listings online, remember that you will see the seller's agent's info and you might wanna reach out to them yourself and I think it'll streamline the process. But remember, like I said before, a seller's agent represents the financial best interests of the sellers, not buyers. They don't have your best interest at heart and can end up losing more money than you save. And a buyer's broker represents you. And you'll make sure to ask the right questions and develop a competitive offer strategy to make sure that you get the apartment. And Farah is gonna put it in the chat. There is a condo versus called personality choice for you to take um, if you're interested in still figuring out what is right for you of the two properties. So uh, next slide, which is making an offer and negotiating the terms, which I think, you know, I'm just gonna land, hand it over to Rashida and I can jump in if, oh, well, the importance of having a cover letter is still something I should point out, I guess. And being the first offer. Those are two words of advice. And I'll hand it over to Rashida. Hi. So you found, you know, you've got pre-approved, you have your pre-approval letter, you've worked with Victoria and her team, and you've now put in your offer for that wonderful property that you found. Now it's time to get into that contract of sale. Um, the realtors initially will negotiate the term. So they'll go back and forth regarding the purchase price, whether there's a mortgage contingency, um, any other things that are included um, in the transaction, if they're you know, um, giving any discounts and things like that, all of that will go into that final accepted offer terms. And then they will send us, the attorneys, what we call as a deal sheet. Um, from that deal sheet, it basically summarizes what the accepted offer was. And we're able to now go to the next step of putting that into the contract of sale. The seller's attorney sends out the contract. As your buyer's attorney, my job is to review that contract, make sure all of the terms are acceptable, and also add in additional protections to you, what we call as a buyer's rider. Um, also, prior to you signing the contract, if you're looking at a co-op or a condo, my job is to do due diligence on the building. That due diligence means even though you love the unit or the property itself, when you saw it, you want to know what type of building or corporation or condominium association you're buying into. Is there litigation? Is there a history of maintenance increases? Is the neighbor complaining about um, noise? Have there been leaks in the building? Are they doing a big capital improvement soon and they're going to have to do an assessment? Um, those type of things that you want to know because you want to budget for that. And if there's something that comes up that you weren't expecting, you want to have to hopefully, if you can't negotiate, um, maybe some type of credit or it may not be the property for you. But that due diligence, especially if you're looking at a co-op or a condo, happens prior to you signing the contract. It can take up to a week. It can take sometimes less or sometimes more, depending on how quickly your attorney gets the information. Um, your attorney is working with the management company to get some documents. We have to review the board meeting minutes. We send over a questionnaire. We get the condo and the co-op offering plan, any amendments, the financials. So it's a lot of paperwork that we have to review. And then we'll go over that and explain it to you. What I explain to my clients is I'm not here to tell you not to buy the property. I'm here to tell you what to expect. It's ultimately your decision um, on what to expect and to guide you hopefully as much as you can. However, if there is a red flag, like the building is going into foreclosure and they have zero reserves, I would strongly advise you not to buy it, but ultimately you may do. I had a client that um, they were looking at a co-op building and the treasurer, when I reviewed the minutes, found out the treasurer was embezzling from the co-op. So they had very little reserves and they had um, you know, a whole bunch of other stuff financially but the clients love the building itself and they were getting, the co-op was in the process of, you know, the, the, um, the treasurer was no longer on the board and they decided to go forward with it. Even though I said, you really don't know what you're going into with the financially with this building. Um, so once again, it's my job as your attorney to advise you through that due diligence on what's going into the building. Um, if you're buying a house, um, a one to four family property, one of the things that you definitely, also for a co-op or a condo, is also doing an inspection. Um, that's done prior to you signing the contract as well, because the contract provides that you're taking it in as-is condition, which means that you've done your inspection, you've seen the property, that you understand the condition of the property. Um, so that's very important that you do that. And all of these things happen prior to you signing. 
So even though your offer has been accepted, if things come up during that due diligence, if things come up during that inspection, you can go back and say, hey, these things came up, I didn't expect it. You know, can we get the seller to make repairs? Can we lower the price? Can we get a credit? So all of these things can happen prior to it. And your attorney works with your realtor to make sure that everyone's aware of what's going on so that if terms have to be negotiated prior to you signing and the contract has to be um, updated, that it can happen prior to you signing. Um, so those are type of the things that, you know, you do prior to, prior to signing the contract. In the contract itself, there are specific terms that you're going to have. Um, mainly, there's a mortgage contingency if you're getting a mortgage. You've been pre-approved by Lisa, great. You've been, um, however, the bank has to do their stuff. Um, typically, it may take 30 to 45 days in your contract to get that mortgage commitment because the appraisal has to be done. All of that documentation has to go back to underwriting. They have to review everything and issue what we call as the official commitment. So pre-approval is great, but the commitment is what is needed for the contract of sale. And most contracts, unless it's an all cash transaction, will have a mortgage contingency. Um, part of that contingency is an appraisal in most contracts. If you're negotiating that appraisal contingency out of the contract, your attorney needs to explain what that means to you as far as what your obligations are. And also your realtor, if the, that's one of the terms that was negotiated, needed to, needs to also explain to you what that means. Um, you can put floors, there's just different ways that you can handle that, but it's very important because an appraisal tells you the value of the property. And that based on that, the bank is able to give you a mortgage. So if you take out that, you may have to come up with extra funds. Your mortgage may have to be adjusted. So it's a very important part of your mortgage and your contract that you have that appraisal contingency in there as part of your mortgage. And if it's being taken out, you understand that. Um, other things that go into your contract of sale, if you're buying a co-op, there's gonna be obviously the contingency that the board has to approve you. And if you're not approved, you get the return of your deposit. If you're buying a condo or a house, there's a title search that's done, which means that the seller has the right to sell you the property. There's no judgments, no liens, any of that on the property that would prevent them from selling you the property. And the same thing for a co-op, they have to give you good title or ownership to the property. So that's one of those terms that are in the contract um, that is generally in there and has to be cleared up prior to you signing the prior to you closing, but it is a term in the contract of sale. Timing wise, um, from when you put in your offer, the due diligence, as I said, takes roughly about a week or so. Once you're getting into contract, your mortgage contingency is typically 30 to 45 days. For your closing, your closes typically is 60 days to 90 days. It can go longer if you're buying a co-op. So I know Lisa had mentioned that, you know, rate lock situation there. So it's always important that you have a conversation with your loan officer. You understand your time periods with your attorney, because if you're locking in your rate for 30 days and you have a closing date that says 60 days, there's a disconnect right there. And you may be hit with some fees that you need to realize. Or if you're locked in your rate, you want to know, OK, if I'm locking in it for 60 days and it's a co-op, and it goes into 90 or 120 days because we're waiting on the co-op to interview you. How is that, how is that gonna affect me? So very important that you understand your deadlines when you're signing that contract of sale so that you can um, plan accordingly. Um, things in New York and other states, there's honor before and you close on this date. In New York, I always explain it fluctuates. I can't tell you 100% you're gonna close on that date because there's so many moving parts. Um, we aim for that date. Once everyone's available and we can close on that day, um, but once again, it's not set in stone until certain things happen. Oh, I'm on mute. <laughs> um, you went over contingencies, right? Contingent on yeah. financing, contingent on inspection. Yeah. Um, Lisa, now that we have negotiated the terms and signed the contract and sent the wire, which is usually 10%, right? Of the yep. 20, 10, of half of the 20% you're time. putting down. Yeah, of the purchase price. Um, then we are in contract. And do you, Lisa, do you wanna start, because Lisa has to jump off. Lisa, do you wanna talk about what happens in contract and then Rashida can take it over? Unless we already lost her. Yeah, sure, I'll just talk about it briefly. I can, I can stay for a little longer. So, um, 
So yeah, so uh, Rashida covered a big chunk of it. And this is actually a really great example of why it's so important to work with a team. Because as Rashida is doing her job and looking at the contract, and if it's a co-op, looking at the board notes and doing her due diligence, she's going to call me. She'll be like, hey, Lisa, I see this. Is this going to be an issue for the mortgage? And um, it's really important to have that because then when I, once I get a fully executed contract, which means it's signed by both buyer and seller, then what we have what's called a live deal, which means I get you initial disclosures to e-sign. I order the appraisal. My awesome team starts to review your docs to make sure we have everything in underwriting and we get you into underwriting as soon as possible. Um, one of the things that really makes me and my team stand out is we're just really fast. And that's really important because like Rashida talked about, you have a mortgage contingency. So you wanna make sure that your mortgage commitment gets to you as soon as possible so that you know there are no issues with the loan. Um, I do a lot of work up front to make sure that there are no issues, but it's a peace of mind and you're also satisfying the requirement of the contract. More importantly, if you're applying for a co-op, you're going to have a board interview. The board will not schedule that interview until you have what's called the commitment letter. Um, once you get the commitment letter, some co-ops say, hey, come in tomorrow for a board interview. Other co-ops say, you know what? where our next meeting isn't for two months. You got to wait until you, the board schedules for you. You have very little wiggle room there. So the faster you get that commitment letter, the faster you get these other pieces of the puzzle moving so that you get close. Um, and then once we get your commitment, you know, we talk about when we want to lock you in. And then we, after the commitment comes, there's a little um, additional conditions, usually really easy stuff like insurance. You buy a property, unless it's a co-op, you have, you have to, per mortgage, have homeowner's insurance, and it has to be paid for the first year and stuff like that. Um, once those conditions are satisfied, you get what's called the CDC, clear to close. And that is a very exciting day. And basically, I email you, and I email Victoria, and I email Rashida, and I say, hey, guys, we're good to go on our end. Let's get this thing scheduled. And then Rashida works with all of the attorneys. If it's a co-op, there's like a gabillion of them to schedule the closing. And it doesn't, you know, just because you get the clue to close doesn't mean you're going to close the next day. Everybody has to work out their schedule so that, um, so that they can all be there to sign off on the necessary documents so that you're closed. Guys, make it sound so easy. <laughs> Um, so Rashida, did you talk a little bit about, uh, you're going to go back to now be, being in contract from your perspective, the due diligence, the closing times, timelines, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I touched a little bit already about the closing timeframes that were in contract. You have the 30 to 45 days to get your mortgage commitment. Um, after that next time period is the schedule of the closing. Closing date is on or about 60 days. If it's a house or a condo. Um, same thing on or about 60 for a co-op, but typically the co-op will be roughly around 90 days. Um, and once we're in contract, your attorney is ordering the title searches on the property to make sure that there's no judgments, no liens, working with the seller side to clear up on the items, um, working with the bank attorney who's assigned to the file. If it's a co-op, getting them certain documents that they need, um, getting the bank attorney, the title report, working with the co-op attorney, to make sure that they have all the documentation recognition agreements and things like that as um, that's going on behind the scenes. So your main focus once you're in contract is to work on your mortgage. And then if you're buying a co-op to get your co-op application in and your attorney is in the background doing kind of those behind the scenes stuff, which is, as I said, working with the title company to get the title um, for the property, clearing up any issues, working with the bank attorney to get them what they need and working with the co-op side as well. Um, once everything lines up, you've got your mortgage commitment, you've been approved by the co-op, or you've got the title report and you've got the waiver from the condo association. So now we're getting the bank clearance to close um, within that 60 to 90 day time period. The next step for your attorney 
is to schedule the, as Lisa said, the, um, the closing with all of the parties. We call that the bank clearance to close. Um, and once again, it doesn't, you get clear today, doesn't mean you're closing tomorrow because there's additional steps that have to happen um, for that. The seller side now has to get all of the documents they need. They have to prepare the deed, the transfer documents, get payoffs if there's a mortgage on the property. The co-op attorney has to get the co-op to sign the new documents for the closing. Um, the bank attorney has to get documents from the bank. So there's things that have to be prepared to get to you so that we're um, all prepared for that closing date. So it can take anywhere from five business days to seven business days. Um, sometimes with co-op management companies, they say two weeks um, for them to get documents before they'll give us a closing date, but it's your attorney that's coordinating with everyone to make sure that happens. Um, and we'll have conversations with you. What's your schedule? When are you looking to close? When the seller is looking to close, lining up everyone. I think it's like a juggling act that I said, I become one of circus trying to get everyone on the same day, the same time in the same location for a closing because the closings are in person. Your contract can be signed electronically, but on the closing date, it has to be in person. You're signing your documents with wet signatures. It's not electronic signatures. Um, if you can't attend the closing as a buyer, which I strongly urge you to be there, but if there is a situation where you can't at um, attend, um, then we'll have a conversation about power of attorneys. Um, I've been seeing like Wells Fargo and Chase lately, they won't allow power of attorneys to your attorney. Um, but so it's something that you want to, you know, have a conversation and it should be worst case scenario that you can't attend your closing in person. Um, but you will be attending typically nine times out of 10, you're attending your closing in person because you have to sign the documents and you're getting the keys on that day. So you really want to, you know, be there for that big experience that you've been saving up for and doing for the past, you know, year or two years or months. Um, so you want to be there for that occasion. And along with that, I'm so glad you mentioned power of attorney, Rashida. That's also something that, um, you know, we do them, but it has to go back through underwriting to approve the power of attorney. So that's not a situation that you're supposed to close on Tuesday and Friday night, you tell me, hey, we're doing a power of attorney. Mm -hmm. Like you need to keep your bank person in the loop. If a power of attorney is something that you're planning on doing, that needs, that's something that should be a part of the discussion, like pretty soon after you make that decision. Um, but like Rashida said, I think it's really not only great, but also really important to be at your closing if possible, because you know, you are signing a lot of really important documents and part of your attorney's job is to sort of explain what you're signing. And, you know, it's just also fun to be there. So, um, but definitely if you're going to do a power of attorney, that's something your financial um, institution needs to know about. It's more, you know, sellers usually are in that position more than, than buyers, um, I would say. Like currently I have a seller that's in Germany and has thankfully sent in their power of attorney. So um, you're in contract. Now we're going to the closing table. Right before we close, we do a final inspection to make sure the property is being delivered in the condition that we um, expect it to be, which means all the appliances are working, all the outlets are working, that they've done any repairs that they've promised. Um, and then you go to the closing table with Rashida. Rashida, um, if you're buying a co-op, the buyer's broker's responsibility is to make the um, co-op application board package to the board, beautifully presented with all of your personal information highlighted in front of them for them to scrutinize. It's going to feel invasive, but this is standard and normal. Um, so don't take it too personally. And then um, that is it. Usually we're scheduling the closing break, you know, stretching your wrist muscles as much far as they can go and signing everything away. And then you are a homeowner. Um, so congratulations, we made it there. That was a lot of information that we smushed into that hour. I know that, that Lisa has to jump off. We're going to stay for a couple of minutes and answer any questions that people have. So you can go ahead and put those in the chat um, or you can take yourself off mute and jump in. And I just want to say, Lisa, thank you for joining and for your time. And we'll post your information. Do you want to say anything before we sign off? Yeah, no problem. I'm sorry I got to sign off um, child care, but um, 
feel free to reach out to me. My Calendly link is in there. My email will be in there. I'm happy to have a discussion, answer any questions you have. And yeah, thanks so much for joining. I'm gonna jump off. Thanks, Victoria. You're welcome. Thanks, Lisa. So if um, after this class, you'll get an email with a link to this recording, go ahead, share it around. You're gonna get a link to our home buying handbook. Um, if you decide to work with us, you're gonna get a link to RealTMX, which is our backend database that isn't public um, and is not like StreetEasy or those other platforms. You're going to have access to Basecamp, which is our library of resources that we've meticulously curated. So at every step of the way, you have information and education to guide you through this process in depth, written resources, not just me summing it up briefly for you. But, um, and then uh, the session will be available on YouTube. And we've been tracking the questions you've had so far. So I'm just going to go and look in the chat and see what questions are there and see if uh, there's anything I can help you guys with. Thank you. Appreciate Intertrix and the content. Great. Thanks, Margaret. Any specific questions about the buying process or things you've seen in the market or challenges about financing, about the rentals? No. Okay, great. Is that or people are not typing as fast as um, I'm speaking? I just trying to see the process. I do speak fast because super excited about this process. Um, okay, well, we're going to send the links for you guys to schedule 15 minute calls. You can talk to us afterwards. Um, and I'm always happy to talk to anybody, even if you're like buying in another state or not in Brooklyn. I usually don't work with those people, but happy to talk to you about, you know, any of your things you're considering and give you my two cents to help you guide you through there. Just free information is the best way to make sure that everybody turns out in good scenarios. So thank you guys, everybody. Should we roll up? Oh, wait, here we go. I know some of people were just going to type as fast as they get their sites. How long does that make for you to talk to you? Free approval. What about now? Yes. Headphones. Oh my God. Okay, now you can hear me. I'm so sorry about that. I've invested, this is like my fourth pair of headphones. <sighs> so sorry. So how many mortgage lenders should you speak to? So you should only try to let one or two run your credit. You should interview people up until you find the person you feel comfortable talking to, that you like them, that they don't give you bad vibes, like that they get you, that they've come recommended by other people. Majority says that most people are going to be the same with the interest rates. So unless you're working, your banks are the people that are more locked into not having competitive interest rates because they usually only order, offer products within the bank and not other people's products. So that's why talking to different mortgage lenders is important to make sure they have an array of different products to offer you based on your situation. If you have a special situation, like you um, own your own business, you're self-employed, those are sort of things you want to make sure you find a really good match for, and that may take a little bit than talking to one person. But generally, one or two people sort of get the idea that you have up until the week before you know you're signed your contract that and it's fully executed to sort of hone in on who you want to work with. And sometimes that changes. Like I have a client that two clients thought they were going to work with one mortgage lender, but then found out there was a product for this specific building that offered them something very like much more competitively less than their everybody else because it was a certain product tied to the building under the underlying mortgage. Um, so, you know, finding out that information made them, you know, switch because it was going to over the long run save them a lot of money. So talking to, to a couple of people, I would always say is important. Did that answer your question? I mean, not like 10, like three, maybe five. Thanks, Renee. That was a good question. Yeah, you were thinking three. Three is about right. For me, like I think it's 
good when you talk to three real estate brokers. So I have no problem. Like you want to pick the right person for you. So there are some tricks and things people say to, especially for sellers, brokers, not so much for buyers, brokers to like convince you to work with them. So just be up for and on the lookout for people. Sometimes people use fear tactics. Like don't be like this person, nobody in this process should make you feel fearful or scared. They should make you feel like um, supported and protected and that you're on their team and that you're rooting for them. You know, like we're rooting for you. Like anybody that's using fear-based um, strategies is not actually looking out for you at the end of the day, in my opinion. It's just a sales strategy that's dated and you usually associate with like used carsmen, car salesmen. Thanks for all your helpful are, are there any unique challenges to purchasing a brownstone? Um, I mean, quality of construction. Rashida, from your perspective, are there challenges? I would say just like you're buying a home that usually has a lot more maintenance of the actual property. Uh, yeah. Like I would the roof, say, I mean, there's a lot more things can go wrong. Yeah, I would say definitely 100% is you definitely want to do that inspection um, because the cost of anything is going to be on you 100% versus if you're buying a condo or a house. I'm sorry, a condo or a co op. Um, other things with brownstone, some of them are. Um, predates what we call a certificate of occupancy for the build for the um, for the property. So you want to find out, you know, is it being used as a is it a real is it a one family is it a two family is it being used as a two family or a three family? What is it? Is, is does a seller have a certificate of occupancy? Um, because sometimes it, as I said, they predate them so that they've been either haven't been using it that way or they have and they just don't have the certificate of occupancy. So. Um, other than the, you know, the attorney, when you get into contract is going to do the more due diligence with the title company that does all of the searches to make sure the seller has the right to sell, to make sure there's no judgments or violations on the property. But very important, especially if you're looking at brownstones and things like that, or houses, is that inspection prior to you signing. And then also just kind of knowing that, you know, whether it's a legal one family, a legal two family, or a legal three family property. Yeah, not having a CFO, you people hear me, right? Uh, CFO has been a challenge for getting permits filed and, and work done on, on some of these properties. Any other questions about specific property types? You're very welcome. Thanks, Jada. Okay. Hello. Oh, yeah. Renee's taking themselves off mute. I love it. Hit us yes, with your question. I, I'm always confused. If you, because I said I was looking into three mortgage lenders, um, is there a certain time period where it doesn't affect your credit score if like all three of them running at the same time? Because I've always heard about like a 45 day period or something like that where you can have your credit run and it doesn't, I guess, because it's going to be a hard pull anyway, but does it really affect your credit score if all three of them are doing it so, at the same time? So so what I know is that housing is a protected class and it shouldn't affect your credit at all. Um, that is what I am, have been told that as long as it's not, you know, it would be more like other things that were being like affected. And it's, if it did affect it, like for credit reports, when you're running it for housing, for like um, rent, rent, rental applications, it's like one to two points possibly. But as far as I know that, what Lisa has said to me previously is that housing is a protected class and the quote hard pull of your credit shouldn't affect it. Rashida, is that correct? Yeah, I believe, I've heard that as well, that if it's during a certain time period, like if you're shopping around, um, but once again, you shouldn't shop around with, have them pull it a lot. But I think if it's during that process of for getting it for a mortgage, that I, I thought it was 30 to 45 days, but at least I'm sorry, Lisa got off, but she probably could give us a more definitive answer. But, but you'd I, also run your own credit and then have a copy of your credit report, as long as it's from like TransUnion, Equifax, or other words, and then just supply it to them. Because if you're just still shopping around, they're going to do the hard pull when it gets like you have to do a hard pull at before closing because they recheck your credit throughout the process. So at, at the beginning of the process, you could just run your own credit and provide that as you if until you decide who you want to work with. Mm -hmm. So you suggest I run my own credit report? Because I've tried this before, like last year, and I noticed that the lender had used a different um, 
I don't know, it's another company that they pull my credit report and it was very different from what I was viewing on like Credit Karma or like Equifax. Like they found other stuff. Yeah, credit Karma is see. not, I was yeah. gonna say Credit Karma is probably- <laughs> I know, so that's what I learned that. Yeah, um, so and, I, and I believe that the, the lenders actually use the third, the lowest of all of the credit bureaus. It's not the highest. So even if you run for like, get all of them, they use the lowest one for, um, for the approval process. Okay. And there's the three make the three credit uh, are TransUnion, Equifax, and what's the third one? Experian. Experian, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. those are where you'd pull from. You can't use credit card. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just pull from it directly. Okay. But they pull all three. So we like when I run people's credit for apartments, it's like through Equifax, I think, because it's through Landlord Guard. Got it. And do you have any recommendations for if you do need to fix your credit repair? Because I've had an issue with, um, what is it called? Like a chargeback or something to do with a credit card that I was an authorized user on. And so- Lisa, I got one person from Lisa and then I have another person that I've had a client recommend to me. Like, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't want to say I recommend these people. I can give you their names and you should vet them and make sure they're legit and all that kind of stuff. But I have two numbers I can share with you. If you shoot us an email afterwards. Okay. Or, Farah, you have Renee's email probably from her signing up for the class. Uh, we will pull that information for you. All right, great, thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? What happened last year? Why did you not move forward? Because um, I was actually involved in the sale of a brownstone. So I waited for the proceeds. So now I'm trying to start the process again. Good position to be in. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm going through the, well, I haven't done it yet, but I'm ready to start the, um, pre-approval phase. Great. That's the first step. <laughs> Any other questions before we sign off? Yes, have I have. One. Oh, I yeah. Have I love um, the question part. Can't you tell? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm legally married, but I'm separated. Would that be an issue if I would like to purchase a home on my own? Rashida, I think like you just have to yeah, you can definitely, so. Well, um, you can definitely purchase a home on your own. Um, you're going to be the only person on the mortgage. You're going to be the only person on the deed. Um, for planning purposes, as an attorney in me, um, if you're not, um, you know, you're not divorced yet, you may want to have something like a pre a separation agreement so that your spouse can come back and you know try to claim any ownership or anything of that property or proceeds. They can't legally own it, but they can say, hey, you use the funds from our marriage to purchase it. And when you go to sell it, I want to get a percentage of that. So you may want to, you know, protect yourself in that if you're separated to, you know, some type of separation agreement or something like that. It's, it's, it's not a legal, it's, you know, it's not a legal separation. So I guess it's best to get a legal separation. Um, I, you know, but you, I don't want to say you had, because from, I remember this conversation because I got divorced, like, you just need them to sign something saying they will never claim that this piece of property is that. So you, if you're not ready to sign a legal, you should talk to a, a, your a divorce lawyer first, I would say, as somebody that specializes in this, but you would probably have them sign something from what I know, saying that they will have no legal claim to this moving forward, that you're like, they're pur you're purchasing this with your own funds and not your married funds. Right, because what I've been running into is that, you know, I've been looking into um, different programs um, for first time home, home buyers. And they, the question is, is, you know, if you're married or separate or, you know, they want something and, you know, that's like a, a deterrent to hinder. And you can say you're separated, but you don't have to have legal separation for, to say you're separated. Do you? I don't, no, I, I mean, I honestly, yeah. you need to go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, maybe the reason that they're asking that question is just how you're going to hold title to the property. Because mm -hmm. if you're married, they're thinking your spouse is going to go on title with you as, um, and may not go on the mortgage, but they're going to go on title issue. No, if you're, no, um, <laughs> no. Or if they're taking your spouse income into consideration. I mean, there is a, on the, on the application for the loan. I do, when I review with the clients, it does say single, unmarried, married, separate. It does have that, um, one of the options for you to tick. And then on the mortgage documents at closing, a lot of the mortgages still put in a married woman or a married, you know, a single um, 
woman on that. And that's really basically how you're going to hold title to the property. They need to know that portion of it. Um, okay. Even though it will be all my information that, you know. Yeah, so you can legally buy something even though you're still married. It's more about how you're going to hold title, whether they are um, the person that you have, you know, you're, you're separated from is going to have any ownership interest in there through the marriage or can claim to it. Um, certain states like New Jersey, for instance, even if you're, if you're married, when you're purchasing property, um, that spouse can still say, because the common law state can say that, hey, they own, they're entitled to an interest in the property. So when you go to sell, even though if they're not on the deed and they're not on the mortgage, they will have to sign a form for that. So that's in New Jersey. In New York, that doesn't apply. They don't have to sign any form on that if you're selling the property but it's mainly for your interest if you, you know, for family law planning and things like that. You don't want to have your spouse claim that, hey, use this fund. So when you go sell the property, I'm old, you know, it was part of our marriage, marital property. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm going to assume that's it. Okay, so... Uh, like I said, you guys can speak to us directly after this. We thank you guys so much for your time and we hope you found this presentation helpful. It's just a small piece of the puzzle. Um, there's a lot more information to share, but we, you know, who would go to a Zoom that's longer than an hour? And now we're at an hour and 12 minutes. So um, let's talk more um, and continue this process. And I look forward to hearing from all of you. Have a good night. <laughs>